leverage the power of video without any technical know-how and equipment. And that was back in the era when cost per click or CPM rates were very low on social channels. That is not the case anymore. Create content, distribute your content, how to monetize your content. A small business or a large business, a solopreneur, there's a lot of best practices that we can all start to use very easily. Sale, 50% off site-wide. Hey, I'm Ruben from Dub, a video sharing platform for business. Since we started, we have helped thousands of people in sales, marketing, and other fields communicate ideas more effectively with video. We have also used video to drive our own growth. Along the way, we have discovered nine essential tips and tricks for using video to drive sales. These tips will help you boost sales, hit aggressive growth goals, and do so all with a limited budget. First it was the streets, then it was the papers, then it was online, now video was just content that people need, man. Step one, make a personal connection with your prospects. Making a personal connection with your prospects can sound like a daunting task. It's important to make videos that speak to the gatekeepers, decision makers, and evangelists. Start by creating webcam videos of yourself to let people get to know you on a personal level. Address their pain points and their goals and show that you can relate. Always follow up with actionable solutions. Provide value from the beginning and do not be too aggressive that turns people off. When I connect with someone on the phone, they've already opened a couple of emails from me. Wow, it's actually you. I'm, I've seen a couple of your videos and so I feel like I know you already. It's like me being in a thousand different places at once, making introductions. By the time I actually do connect with them, that lead's already warmed up and they have this impression of me as like this kind of celebrity. It builds you up as, as your own brand. That's the power of video. Step two, know your competition. What are your competition's offerings? How do they compete? A complete understanding of the competitive landscape can help guide the videos that you create. It's effective to share screen recordings to show the value of your product or service. That being said, don't be too focused on beating the competition on features and price. It's always better to show value based on commitment and customer service, proving with words and actions how much you actually value the client. You don't wanna get into that field where you're doing this head-to-head -head comparison feature by feature. When you do hit, get hit with a question from someone, they're like, well, did you know that your competitor does this? Knowledgeable of your competition and your answer is really quick, comes right out and you're like, yeah, they do that, but you know, we do this. Step three, communicate your value proposition clearly. Video is a powerful communication tool, but long-winded videos can cause disinterest and boredom. Boost engagement by spending the time to refine your value proposition with a focus on maximizing clarity. Growth process, what is the biggest mistake that they can make? They don't know how to talk about their product. Biggest mistakes, you have a great product and you have a great team and you don't know how to distill it, develop the product, but you're not developing the brand narrative. Use multiple videos to test different variations and get feedback from colleagues and friends. Instead of reading a long list of features, speak from your heart and communicate the top level benefits. In addition to having a kind of clear, concise value prop, it's, it's really beneficial when you have a little bit more personalization. So if you're able to kind of tailor your value prop based on the conversation you've had with someone, that's really gonna have, I think, the highest chance of connecting with them and they're gonna feel like, okay, he's speaking directly to me. Step four, the gold is found in the follow-up. Send different types of videos on specific channels to follow up with previous communication. Don't be discouraged if you don't get a response from your first follow-up. Persistence on all channels will set you apart. So I was talking to this business owner, this guy prospected him on LinkedIn, reached out to him with a video. He was like, yeah, no, you know, I'm not interested. But then he opened his email and and there was another video from the same guy with a different message and it just kind of blew him away. He's like, wow, this guy is on all channels with video. I know who he is now. I know what he looks like. Invested into both that guy's product and our own. Don't be afraid to prospect on all channels. Make sure you always bring value to the prospect. Do your research and connect with them on a personal level. Video follow-ups are great for a one-to-one -one basis, but here's a more nuanced strategy for B2B. If you haven't heard from an important lead that you connected with on email, create a general video on LinkedIn and mention them in the comments. This creates an opt-in environment where your contact then makes the decision to pick up the conversation. And if they don't respond to you, at least you have an asset on LinkedIn that other people can see. Step five, scale face-to-face -face connections. It's not always easy to meet people face-to-face. -face. If you can't meet in person, then let them see your lifestyle by publishing videos to your personal channels that document your life in an accessible way. Make videos of you with your team members, family at work, and doing real life stuff. This allows people to connect with you on a personal level, not a buyer to seller level. That personal connection leads to sales and word of mouth marketing for your business. 
Step six, create social content that gets people's attention. Make sure to cultivate a broader audience. Building an audience creates opportunities for the acquisition and nurturing of prospects to conversions. Tutorial videos can show that you are knowledgeable and that you're not afraid to share your insights. It's helpful to position yourself as a consultant, a guide, an advocate, Become a teacher as much as possible. Show them what is changing in their industry and share emerging and established best practices. Step seven, provide social proof. Sharing video testimonials is a proven method of increasing conversions. Video creates a human connection that text testimonials cannot provide. When your audience watches a video that showcases users who have succeeded with the help of your solution, that builds trust, intrigue, and fear of missing out. Use Dub's reply with video feature to easily gather video testimonials. With Dub, it's easy to enable video replies directly from a video landing page. Your recipients don't even need to install anything. One click and they can record a video testimonial directly from their webcam or phone. Professionally produced testimonials are nice to have, but they don't always feel as personal. Start with testimonials your clients can record themselves. This creates an authentic context, which creates an emotional impact. Social proof can come in many forms. It could be testimonials, it could be use cases, it could be trust badges. It could just be simply people using your product or service. Figure out ways to capture that proof in video format and let other people see it. The results will be staggering. Step eight, close deals. Once they have committed to trying out your product or service, create a clear path to the finish line. Create a video that confidently asks them to close the deal. Rely on videos early in your funnel to build up those relationships. Just before the deal is closed is another really valuable op for video. You've had a great conversation with someone, recap that in a video and send it to them because then they can share that with the ultimate decision makers or anyone else who might have some input on that decision. When creating your bottom of funnel videos, don't be afraid to go for the ask. Be mindful of people's time. Make your videos concise and easily digestible. Boost conversions by adding a call to action to your video landing page. This will allow prospects to fill out a form, pay online, or even sign a contract. Step nine, make your clients evangelists. Once you have seen lift to your sales from using video, your process is still not complete. Get your users to create videos using your product and encourage them to share those videos on social media. Your best marketers are your clients. Get them to fall in love with your product, fall in love with you, and evangelize the value that you provide to other people. Make your clients evangelists by offering incentives for them to share videos on how they get value from your offerings. This builds a network of people who are passionate about your product and are willing to share their experiences with the world. I hope you can use these tips to use video to boost your sales and build excitement around you and your brand. Hey guys, it's Ruben and I'm in the car headed to the San Jose airport and this is a video marketing masterclass and really teaching you how to leverage the video medium, create content, distribute your content, how to monetize your content. Just watch this full video and it'll give you the whole masterclass. <laughs> Who is it that you're speaking to? Who's your target audience? Story is where it all starts. You gotta figure out what you're talking about, if you're selling something, if you're communicating, if you're expressing yourself. So what are you trying to convey to them? What are your goals? What is the true desire to make your video? Really tap into that. What is the story that you're trying to tell these people? Are you trying to educate people? Are you trying to delight them? Are you trying to entertain them? Are you trying to express yourself? What is your goal? And map out some sort of a sequence or some sort of a script or some sort of a shot list so that you can have a path on how to create your video. Planning is gonna be your best friend. What is it that you want people to do afterwards? Do you want them to buy something? Do you want them to feel something? Do you want them to connect with you, to follow you, to subscribe to your channels? Oh, by the way, subscribe to our channel. Or do you just wanna put some content out there just to get some views and have some fun? I'm gonna walk on this little ledge here. We're gonna play a bunch of different types of music and you're gonna see how it feels different based on the music that we play. Check this out.
Whatever your goal is, video is a great way to capture a story and to distribute it right to people's eyeballs. Once you have the people in mind and once you have a general idea of what the story is, the next thing is you're gonna wanna have some sort of a general script or a shot list or at least some sort of an outline that you can capture with video. You don't have to be Steven Spielberg to write a script. The script is really just dialogue, the location, the things that are happening on screen. It's just an easy way for you to know what you're shooting and what the people should be saying. Just because you write dialogue doesn't mean that that's what the dialogue is. Some of the best dialogue on the internet right now is unscripted, unwritten. In fact, there's been such a craze in the last 10 years to get unscripted reality-based content where it's people just speaking off the cuff, being just honest and saying how they feel right then and right there. Lifestyle shots just really show visual representations of the characters or of the people in your video. Instead of having to say things through the script, sometimes it's easier just to show them. You can get close-ups of my shoes, that I'm here in this location, why am I here, why am I in San Francisco, what's going on here. I mean, there's so many opportunities to show my life. For people to be able to see these types of pickup shots, it gives you a certain connection to the subject and to say, well, I feel like I kind of know that person because I know about their shoes or their phone or their shirt. Next thing that's important is to figure out the elements of your story. Where are you going to shoot this? Who's going to be in it? Are there props? Is there something that you're demonstrating? Sometimes you want something that's kind of visually interesting like this, but sometimes you don't want anything at all. You just want a white wall behind you. It's really up to you to figure out where you're going to shoot your piece. We recommend to take what you have so that you don't need to go through the process of creating a production set. If you have certain props or if you have a location, take advantage of those and use those. Quite often the most organic locations are the best because they're real and they're relatable. At the end of the day, it's really all about the story and it's all about the connection and the things that you convey. But let's just face it, it's more interesting if you have something kind of stimulating to look at and maybe it's even more fun for us. Once you have a general map of what you're going to shoot, the next thing is to hit record. A lot of the times, you can do a test shoot. That doesn't mean that that's the final product. Grab your phone and just do a mock recording of whatever you want to do. You can do a selfie video, you can shoot someone else, you can stand your phone, a tripod, or even on a stack of books. The point is, is that see and feel what it's like to record your video and see what it looks like. Even if it's just a rough draft, it'll give you an idea of what the final outcome could look like. Framing is another really important thing that you got to consider. Sometimes you want to use the rule of thirds where the subject is on one side or the other side of the frame. The reason why this works is because it's not so obstructive right in someone's view as they're looking at it. And plus, there might be something visually interesting here to look at. Other times you want to go direct to camera so that your subject is looking right within the frame. And that helps when you want to make an impacting statement that people can really connect to. Another premise is that you always want to keep it rolling because you never know what's going to happen. Something funny can happen or something interesting can happen. Your videos don't have to be complex, they can really be simple. It can be screen videos or videos that you shoot with your phone or something produced, even a video that you shoot on your webcam. The point is that you're creating content to put out there on social channels to communicate with people. There's tons of data that show that spending more money on a video doesn't make it better. In fact, some of the most viral videos on the internet are the ones that don't have any production value. Lean into that and figure out a way that you can leverage whatever you have to create content. This is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Very small chance that you'll create some content that goes viral. Chances are you produce a lot of original content that you continue to put out there. Tap into smaller hits of traffic that organically grow your brand and grow your content. Realize that you're gonna have to do a lot of takes and a lot of test setups for your video. So don't just shoot one video, maybe shoot two to three and just figure out which one you like best. A lot of the times as you're shooting, you realize things that you can tweak on the fly, things to make it shorter or more concise or more interesting ways to communicate. Don't stop until you get a piece that you like, but at the same time, don't kill yourself trying to get the perfect piece. Once you have a general video, realize that you can cut that into different lengths. Just because you have a 60 second video doesn't mean that you can't create a couple of 15 second videos or even six second videos. Social media loves shorter videos because people's attention spans are really short. Try to figure out a way to take your single video and to parse it into multiple videos that you can test and figure out which length works the best. Once you have your versions of your video, you're going to want to get it out there. You can email them, you can put them on social, you can put them on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. There's a lot of different ways that you can distribute them. You're doing a test and you're seeing which one gives you the most traction. As you put your videos out, realize that it's a catalyst for conversation. Anytime you get an engagement, a like, or a comment, try to re-engage and reply to every single comment because that's going to help you get more organic visibility. 
When it comes to distribution, there's one to many and one to one. One to many is when you're putting your video out there for multiple people to see on social channels or an email blast. But one to one is when you send your video directly to a person with some level of personalization. If your videos are sales focused, there's a couple of keys to getting the most conversions. Number one is adding some level of personalization when you send it to someone individually. And that just could be in the email or in the subject line. Another thing is to have social proof. When people see that there's some validation or other people are having success, they feel they wanna take advantage of whatever you're offering so that they can benefit themselves. Another thing if your videos are sales focused is give people a clear call to action. Have empathy for the people, understand who they are, address their needs, and then provide some sort of a solution that can help them save time or save money. Your product can be a vitamin or it can be a pain pill. Either way, people are gonna to wanna to buy it. The proportion size of your video is also important. Typical videos are in 16 by nine. Instagram and Facebook really promote square videos, and IGTV is actually promoting nine by 16 videos, which is basically taking a phone and shooting it upright. Keep in mind, when you export your videos, you can export it to multiple format sizes to test which one works best. The reason why square and vertical videos do better is because they occupy more real estate on people's phones when they're looking on social. So there's less distractions of them finding something else beneath your video. And remember, it's not just about a video that you can make. A video needs a lot more components in order to work. You need to have a compelling landing page, a clear call to action, and an entire funnel that people can go through to do what you want them to do, or more so what they wanna do. The landing page on which your video sits is critical because that's where people are gonna go and click play to watch your video. Now that can be YouTube itself, or it can be a page on your website. It's important to have a clear call to action or even multiple calls to action on that video page so that when people are done watching the video, they can click the link or click the button below to move on to the next step. Sometimes it's good to address whatever that next step or whatever that call to action is in the video, but sometimes it's also limiting to do that in case you wanna change or test new things. Remember that people's attention spans have shrunk big time, so your videos shouldn't be too long. It's really hard to get someone to watch a longer sales-oriented video, whereas if it's something educational that they can get something out of, then they're willing to put in the time of a six or even 10 minute video. The great thing about data tracking is that we can figure out which aspects of our creativity are working better to achieve our goals. Once you have your videos out there, take a hard look at the data, what the watch rates are, what percentage of the video people are watching until, and if people are clicking on your call to action. As you start to have multiple videos, you can A-B test and figure out which one's working the best. It's also really important to be conversion focused. So while it is important to figure out how much engagement you're getting, it's also really important to figure out what your conversion rates are which means how people are actually driving to the final goal that you have. Once you have videos out there, remember that your process is not done. You've got a lot of work to do. Video marketing is a living, breathing thing that you have to continue to do and feed and optimize and put more time and effort into. It doesn't finish after you've produced your first set of videos. It's constantly ongoing, based on data, based on improvement, and based on how much you achieve your goals and how much fun you're having. Hi, I'm Shannon from Dub, and this is the definitive guide to video marketing. By now, you might have seen some of the videos that I create for Dub. We've received lots of questions about how we use video for our own sales and marketing, so we decided to create this guide. Here's what we learned. Step one, know your audience. Identifying your target audience will help guide you towards creating a video that makes the most impact. So who are you trying to reach? What do they care about? So really know your audience, how you can connect to them on an emotional level. Step two, figure out the struggle of your target audience. What are the main problems that your target audience deals with? Step into their shoes and relate to the struggles that they face. This crew, which is called Strig, talk about addressing a pain point. It's a massage device. Step three, figure out how you provide value. Think about how you or your business solves your target audience's problems. Figure out what your goals are. Like, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? And then reverse engineer that. Find a way to describe your value proposition in a direct and simple way. Another really important thing is showing social proof in your product. So if you can show your product being used, really helping them solve their problems, it gives social proof, it gives validation. Step four, brainstorm ideas. Brainstorm as many ideas as possible and write them down, even the bad ones. No bad ideas, we're just this rapid is fire. A safe place. This is a safe place. The brainstorming, the whiteboarding. Keep it simple, you know, have a yeah. really simple premise. I think the challenge is always to make it interesting. How do you make a product demo something fun to watch? I have all these kind of concepts on the board. Be open to all ideas and then let them ruminate. Come back later and then edit them down until you find the idea that resonates the most. Step five, record tests. See how the idea feels in action by recording tests. The thing that's amazing about digital content is that you can constantly iterate, put it out there in the world, 
and it sinks down a feed, and then the next day you start all over again. Enact whatever idea, or whatever concept we have, like a low mm. fidelity situation. Don't worry about the equipment that you use. A good idea will work in a lo-fi format. Hey guys, it's Ruben. Hey guys, it's Ruben. Hey guys, it's Ruben, and I'm really excited to announce. Step six, hit record. Once you're comfortable with your idea, it's time to hit record. Expensive equipment is nice to have, but it's not needed. Your phone has a great camera. Each step does count. Keep creating content as you go. Your production value can get better and better. Focus on the fundamentals that help drive your story. The script, framing, sound, lighting, and editing. Remember that depending on your idea, you might not need editing or even a script. Fundamentals are always in service of a good story. You could use improvisation and then edit it later, or you could take the time to write a great script and then record it in one take with no edits. However you record it, creativity and storytelling will make your video great. Side note, you know, get your logo on your videos within the first couple of seconds, because if someone does kind of ignore your video, at least they got a little bit of a brand play there. Step seven, determine your placements. Now that you've finished your video, determine where to distribute your content. Be mindful that different formats are suited for different places. 16 by nine aspect ratio is the standard for YouTube and it works really well on most platforms. However, emerging formats such as vertical and square videos can perform better on mobile first social networks such as Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Platforms like Dub give you more control over the landing page that displays your video. With Dub, you can customize your page however you want, add call to actions, and many more useful features. Step eight, get the word out. After you've posted your video, make sure to get the word out and start conversations about your content. I'm gonna do a really funny video, put it on Facebook, and then just get everyone to share it because it's super entertaining to watch. And then that becomes their lead gen system, entertainment that is lead gen. Use at replies to mention people or companies that you may have talked about in your video. Reshare your video across personal and corporate accounts and leverage emails to directly notify people about your new video. And don't be afraid to put advertising dollars behind your video. Right now, it's one of the best times to advertise in video because it works. Just find a video that converts and a funnel that gets you the numbers that you're looking for. Don't forget to test everything. Step nine, get data. Wait a few days and then look at the data. How many views, watch time length, reshares, email opens. Look at all of the data that you can find and use that information to build strategies on how you can make more videos. Step 10 is repeat. Go back to step one and begin the process all over again. Nowadays, more content is always better. But as you continue to make content, remember to follow your gut and do what feels right. Data is extremely helpful, but sometimes it can cause you to constantly reevaluate what you're doing. If you commit to something that you believe in, it may pay off more than you ever expected. Whether you're a B2B, a B2C, a B2B2C, a B2G, or whatever else type of company, you're gonna need more leads to really drive up your business. Video is such a powerful medium to capture your stories, to build trust, streamline your communication. With Dub, there's a lot of different ways that you can create videos, share videos, and then track videos that will help you to drive more leads. Like with the Dub Chrome extension, you can record whatever you see on your screen to provide value and to convey information to people. The Dub website, the mobile app, and the various extensions, you can actually record webcam videos that you can then share with people to really personalize your communication. And when people see personalized, valuable, educational information, they're more likely to fill out that form, move down your funnel, and to become a lead in your pipeline. There are six goals every business wants to achieve and how to achieve those goals using features on Dub. <laughs> The universal goal for all businesses is to increase conversions. One way Dub can help you increase conversion rates is by utilizing video in emails and on landing pages. According to Cisco, they have a study that shows video on landing pages increases conversions by up to 80%. Dub can be used to embed videos in emails and on landing pages, which has been shown to universally increase conversion rates. So what's the benefit everyone wants? Increased conversion rates. How do you get it? Dub videos on your landing pages and in your emails. 
consider putting screen recordings in your ads as well so you can really have that element of social proof. Taking a screen recording of something real like your dashboard and incorporating that into your ads. Email is still a very powerful channel for communication in business. We all use it. But the fact is that our inboxes and our prospects' inboxes are completely filled with information. What's great about having a video in your email is that people are actually curious to see what the video entails. What we recommend is to put the word video in the subject line and then have an animated GIF within the body of the email along with the call to action. The reality is that it's kind of difficult to put all those elements together. With Dub, all of those things can be done automatically. You can generate an animated thumbnail GIF that exists directly within the body of your email. You can have a clearly clickable call to action that goes directly to a customized video landing page and you can track the whole thing from the email open to the click to the video watch to the video percentage viewed. It's powerful stuff. can you achieve more revenue by leveraging the power of video? Dub actually makes this so simple. Chances are your industry is not heavily using video. Prospect in your industry does receive a video in their email or they're interacting with one of your videos. It's gonna be very fresh and interesting and really be a, an excellent opportunity for you and your salespeople and your marketing staff to stand apart from the rest of the industry. The other way Dub really allows people to increase revenue in their company is by enabling salespeople who are very good at what they do to leverage the power of video without any technical know-how and equipment. With the Rex CRM integrations and Gmail add-ons, Outlook add-ons can now excel through email and through social channels by putting their best asset themselves in front of their prospects. The other great benefit of leveraging video is that it shortens the sales cycle. It really allows you to begin building that trust and establishing that relationship much earlier than you'd be able to do through plain text and advertisements. Here's a few ways to use Dub to boost your social media impact. First of all, you can use screen videos. That means recordings of your screen. With one click on the Dub Chrome extension, you can record your entire screen. Screen recording videos can be really useful for sharing on social media. If you're showing off a new feature of your product, explaining your website navigation. You don't even have to download that screen share file to your computer. It's all hosted on the Dub Cloud. No more messing with files. There's even direct integrations from the Dub dashboard to share to social media like Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and more. If you're having a one to one conversation on LinkedIn, instead of typing out paragraphs, now you can easily create and share videos without leaving your chat. Whether it's screen share videos, webcam videos, or even uploaded videos, it's really easy to do. We all want better, longer lasting, more fulfilling business relationships. Next best thing to being and connecting with someone in real life is sharing video. And with Dub, you can quickly record videos from all your devices share those and get real-time tracking to see how much engagement there is on your content. People love when you remember things about them like their birthdays, their holidays, and when you remember to acknowledge them. And with Dub, you can actually set up automations for all of your prospects to follow up with them automatically, sending them birthday greetings, holiday greetings, anniversaries of sales and things like that. So if you wanna learn more, check out dub.com and get started today. They keep sending me their messages. Hi, I'm Shannon from Dub, and in this guide, we're going to cover everything you need to know to make effective email campaigns that leverage video. Step one, identify your goals. Before you begin building your campaign, it's important to write down your goals. This allows you and your team to clearly establish the path forward for your email marketing. Your strategy should be tailored to your goal, whether it's to get signups or to bring exposure to an ebook. Who, what, when, where, how. Who, the what, the when, where, and how. Overall, think about your goals in the context of building a movement around your business. There are some companies that have newsletters that are so good that people go out of their way to subscribe to them and they cannot wait to get the content that gets sent to them. Try to be one of those types of companies because then your list grows organically and you have a broader and larger audience to be able to cater and market to. Step two opt-in or nothing. There are no shortcuts in email marketing. I know that is sometimes hard to hear. However, methods that involve acquiring emails that are not opt-in can be more detrimental than you may think. Build up a subscriber base with social media content that promotes your email list. Opt-in subscriptions are the only way to get real results. You'll thank me later. 
something when I'm not on their list. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, like, what's an email that you open? Um, if it's like a survey and I can get a gift card. Your domain reputation is sacred. Don't take risks doing bad email practices. It's just not worth it. Build up an organic list. People will appreciate you for it, I promise. Step three. Create video content. When creating content for your emails, prioritize video. Text, graphical, and audio content are all formats that are important. That being said, video should be the centerpiece in your content ecosystem. And there's a good reason for that. Video has been proven to keep people engaged while building relationships that last. People just prefer watching videos. It's effective when graphical and text content in emails is used in conjunction with videos that provide value while also fostering curiosity. Use animated GIFs with a play button inside your emails to get people to click on your videos. Go to Giphy.com, click upload if you want to upload a file or paste the YouTube link. We recommend GIFs and emails being less than two megs. Two to three seconds is sufficient. Keep in mind the first few seconds of the video should hook viewers as much as possible. People are overwhelmed with information right now. Our inboxes are completely flooded. Put really good content, completely transparent about what you're offering and what you're selling. People will appreciate you. Step four, package the email. Take time to optimize the way that you package an email. Tell people what you are offering them in the subject line. They can't predict what is on the other side of an email. Make sure to be clear and honest every step of the way. Be completely transparent about what you're offering and how you can provide value. And don't forget to say what your offer is in the subject line. Just use video in your subject line, right? Boom, just just the it. word video, right? Put that, the word yeah. video in your subject line and mean mm. it. Of course, have a video. To so you have, to, you have to actually have the video in there. It, if you're gonna put video in <laughs> yeah. the subject line, you better have a video in the email. <laughs> right. Format the graphics and text in an aesthetically pleasing way. Good design inside the email and on your landing page can help increase conversions. Also, remember to format your emails for mobile devices. Don't be surprised if 80 to 90% of your engagement is on mobile. The more you optimize, the better. Step five, build the funnel. See your email sequence as a funnel. Read subject line, opened email, read email, see call to action, click, view landing page, and so on. When the goal of your email is to get conversions, developing your landing page is key. It's been proven that using a video on your landing page is the best way to capture leads and build your brand. In fact, our data shows that putting a video on a landing page can increase conversions by up to 300%. Step six. Data tracking. Look at all of the data that you can find. Open rates can be helpful to show you the impact of your subject lines. Conversion rates can reveal the impact of your content. Use pixels and add analytics tracking on landing pages. Get excited about unsubscribe rates. That improves your data and shows that your email is healthy, only delivering to those who want to read it. Here's a really good tactical trick. Send a high value email and direct people to a video landing page. On that landing page, have your retargeting pixels from LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and Google. The good thing about retargeting is that you can follow people as they browse the web and send more high value content and only pay for the clicks. Step seven. A-B testing. Test everything because often what you think doesn't work will end up working the best. Do single variant A-B testing to find solutions. Single variant tests that just focus on one aspect of the formatting or design is the only way to reveal exactly how to develop your strategy. The more A-B tests that you do, the more impact your emails will have. A-B test your subject lines. Don't just pick one, pick two. And every time you do another campaign, try a different set and then find the one that really speaks to your audience and to your persona. Step eight, personalize your emails. Build a relationship by sending your campaigns from a person instead of a company account. Use a personal email signature and maybe even consider adding your phone number or a Google voice number. Also consider making a Gravatar a lot of inboxes use the Gravatar service to display thumbnails. Link the social media accounts of your team to build a community. Make sure to add general contact info and adhere to anti-spam laws. In general, it's important to familiarize yourself with the laws that prevent spam and email marketing. Step nine, timing the send. 
carefully consider the time of day that you select to send your email campaign. Send times can vary based on the audience that you're catering to, seasonality, volume of emails being sent, and a variety of other factors. Take what you read on the internet with a grain of salt because industry metrics are changing at a fast rate due to advancements in technology. The best thing you can do is conduct your own research and then try different send times to see what works. If you follow those nine steps, you're off to a great start boosting your email campaigns. Now, here's several effective options for types of emails that you can send. Automated emails. Dropbox does an excellent job of emailing people who have shown interest in their software, but have not fully installed the program. By sending an automated email to those who are inactive, you have a chance to lure them back to your services again. Webinar announcements. An effective way to be seen as a leader in your niche is to run a webinar where you can showcase your knowledge. HubSpot does this well by illustrating how you will benefit from watching and includes a strong call to action with scarcity to get people to sign up. Welcome emails. Buffer does this quite nicely by sending you a welcome email with methods of contact should you have any problems. Even just a simple email that introduces yourself is enough to establish a relationship with your customer. Include links to any valuable content you want to share and also include links to your website and social media. Announcement emails. An easy way to notify your subscribers about big changes within your company is to send out an announcement email. This keeps everyone in the loop and reminds your subscribers why they wanted to sign up in the first place. Postmates does the announcement email seamlessly, targeting users locally with new deals and discounts for deliveries. They also attach new features and opportunities within the same email to keep their users engaged. Free trial emails. For those new subscribers, sending them a promo or an option for a free trial is a great way to get them into your ecosystem. Kissmetrics does this well by sending out a VIP one-to-one -one demo that you can sign up to use. It's also useful just to give your prospective clients a one-week demo of your product. You can also target your current subscribers with the chance to experience the premium version of your product for a week, showing them how life is a lot easier with the upgrade. Upcoming event emails. Of course, you can use email marketing to promote an upcoming event. The trick with this is to use scarcity, urgency, and value to incentivize your subscribers to take action. Send out a series of timed emails with a countdown, as well as a notification on how limited the seats are. Every email needs to spark more and more urgency. Vodafone has an awesome plan for event emails. They have a countdown clock and seamlessly set up their emails to create scarcity, urgency, and extra value. Case study emails. Nothing convinces a person more to take action than social proof. Find a case study about your business that would relate to your target audience. Perfect Audience has a great email campaign to notify you of all the well-known businesses that use their product. So if they will, chances are others will too. Video emails. There's nothing better than to include videos in your email marketing plan. Dub does this perfectly by allowing its users to attach a GIF preview of their video into the email with the play icon. Once the user clicks to play, it'll actually play on the user's custom video landing page. So those are some of the best types of emails that you can use for email marketing. Ruben, would you please come to the stage? Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, sir. You bet. <laughs> All right, how's everyone doing? So I just got off my flight just a little bit ago, red eye, so I'm a little bit exhausted. So if I pass out, just wake me up and I'll continue the talk. But I hope you guys are doing well. Um, I'm gonna take you guys through some really interesting learnings and some, some stuff that I've kind of picked up along the way for leveraging video for business growth and really using video as a medium across all channels to grow your business. Um, whether you're a small business or a large business, a solopreneur, there's a lot of tactics, tactics, a lot of best practices that we can all start to use very easily to use videos. My company is Dub, Dub.com, uh, Dub with two Bs. Um, we are a video sharing and communication platform. So we allow users to create videos um, with our Chrome extension, with a mobile app, um, with our website, and then to share those and distribute those across email or social channels any number of ways. We also have a lot of integrations with HubSpot and Salesforce and all sorts of email systems. Um, and then we've got this powerful data tracking platform. So we can talk about that all a little bit later. Let's get into best practices now. Um, if you guys are on social, of course you are. Um, please consider checking my stuff out at Ruben Dua. So I'm on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, even TikTok. Check it out. 
All right, so here's a little bit of an agenda. We're gonna talk about creation, production, commercials, distribution, and then data tracking. Why video? Okay, well this is serious. Um, we're all using video now. It's taken over our social channels. Facebook, Twitter, obviously YouTube. There's a reason why that's happening. It's because video works. When we watch video, certain neurons in our brain fire and we're able to make connections. What's interesting about this is that we've been visual as a species since the dawn of time. Whether it's cave paintings or hieroglyphics, we've always been, in, we've always been communicating in visual methods. Video, when it popped off a little bit over a decade ago, it opened up this amazing channel. And now, with bandwidth and with technology and, of course, cameras, it's very easy to leverage. So if you're not using video right now in your business, you're missing out. And that is not just from a marketing or from an advertising perspective. That's from a communication perspective. So whether it's explaining how your business works or whether it's you as an individual brand, as a spokesperson, if you're not using video, let's say on LinkedIn, you might be missing out. Now, a lot of people say, well, I'm a little bit shy and I don't really want to put myself out there. We're going to get into that. Creating your videos. So I think about five, six, seven years ago, there was this big movement that happened where everyone said, I want to create a viral video. And there was a couple of great success stories. There was the Dollar Shave Club video, and there was the, you know, the Harmon Brother videos and the sandwich videos, like the, uh, the purple mattress one and maybe the squatty potty. You, know, you guys all noticed these videos, and, and they were great. They were enchanting, and, and they won our hearts. And maybe they you know, took some, some bucks out of our wallet. But the reality is that that's not very easy to do. Um, it's not impossible, but that's a very calculated and a very expensive thing to do. I mean, all of those videos had big budgets behind them. Not to mention there was a lot of dollars that was spent pushing those on YouTube, on Facebook, and that was back in the era when cost per click or CPM rates were very low on social channels. That is not the case anymore. It's much more expensive. Within the last year, the cost per click prices on social media have gone up 10x. So if they were 20 cents before, you can do the math, they're now 10x that, it's amazing, right? So two bucks now just for a click. Um, there's ways to kind of quote unquote game that where you can you know, do CPMs and get more views, but at the end of the day, it's gonna be a cost per click or a cost per acquisition, and it's not cheap. So what does that mean for us? Does that mean that we shouldn't try to get lucky, that we shouldn't try to create our next viral video no, that's not what that means. What it means is that we need to get into a practice of making video a critical part of every aspect of our business. Um, every video exists as part of a funnel. There's a video, maybe it exists on Vimeo, maybe it exists on YouTube, maybe it's on your website. Maybe it's on your blog, maybe it's on Dub, maybe it's on Wistia, maybe it's on Vidyard. There's a lot of great platforms out there. The point is though, is that that video needs to move your target audience and your prospects down some sort of a funnel. So a lot of people think, well, if I put my video out there, it's gonna drive branding, it's gonna you know, get people educated, it's gonna delight them, it's gonna teach them about my business, my product, my service, and that's great. And then they're gonna go and they're gonna convert, they're gonna self-convert, they're gonna go to your website, they're gonna go to your mobile app, they're gonna go to your booth, they're gonna go to your store, and they're gonna convert. That's not really the case. If we as marketers, if we as business people, if we as communicators don't provide a clear path for people to take when they watch a video from the beginning all the way to the end, we're missing out. So I always like to say, whether you're using email or social or SMA, whatever your channel is, the video is just the first step. It's the next steps, that's where the magic happens. So landing pages, they have to be hot. There needs to be a clear message, a clear hero message, a visual at top, a short video that's concise that people can actually consume, they can trust and then a call to action, a button that they can click to move them down the funnel. And that can be from an e-commerce perspective or to fill out a form or to just contact you via phone number. So whatever it is that you're doing for your video, make sure that you've set up a very clear and concise funnel because I promise you it'll make the ROI worth its while. Commercials are awesome. We should all have a commercial. Here's the thing, 
Gone are the days when you need to actually hire a full-on production crew with a makeup artist and a sound editor and a green screen and some crazy location and a Ferrari and a helicopter and the drone shot and the waterfall shot. Those things are, they're not really necessary. I mean, life is all around us. We have so many ways to share our stories, to capture where we are. I mean, our offices are pretty cool these days, right? Our homes are pretty cool. We have cute pets. You know, our backyards are cool. Um, you know, walking down the street in beautiful Chicago or Los Angeles or New York or even small town USA, that's something that's interesting that people want to see and to watch because seeing someone on video is kind of like going on a little mini vacation. You get to kind of experience their world. We don't need to see something out of this world to be enamored or to connect with a person or a brand. We just want to see something real, something authentic, something truthful. And that's what the power of video has. So when you're considering your next commercial, you can have the $50,000 budget or the $500,000 budget, or you can say, you know what? We're gonna do what some of the most powerful large and small brands are doing, which is to capture our personalities. Because guys, I gotta tell you, it's not the companies that are selling the products anymore. It's the people now. Every major brand is associating itself with a person. That's why the whole influencer thing took off. It's because these companies, these major corporations, lacked humanity. They lacked spokespeople. There was a lot of people working at these companies and big buildings that were making things happen, but they didn't have spokespeople to get out there to share stories and to build connections with people. So the influencer thing took off. Now, I don't know where it's at now. There's been some interesting press about you know, the crash of the influencer market. I'm not really sure about that. But what I do know is that people connect to people. So the next time you're thinking about your commercial, don't think about the helicopter shot, don't think about the water, waterfall shot, or don't even think about the celebrity that you wanna hire. Think about you and how you can share your story with those other personalities of your company because that is what people will connect to. Um, distribution is awesome. You know, it's one thing to create your video, it's the next thing to put your video out there. So what are the channels that we're gonna put our video on? That's a great question. Are we a Facebook company? Are we a YouTube company? Are we an Instagram company? What's our target audience? Why don't we start to think about who we're trying to cater to and who we're trying to communicate with? The reality is that all of these social channels here, they, there's no such thing as each one has its own age group anymore. I mean, maybe TikTok skews a little bit younger. I'm on TikTok, but you know, it's probably skews a little bit younger, but the reality is that Facebook has, maybe you could say it's uh, 20s and beyond, but I mean, I know my, my niece that I met with yesterday, she's 13, she's on Facebook. So the point of my story is that we need to think about being omni-channel. And that's a little bit of a jargon term that's being thrown around all over the place. So maybe I shouldn't use it. Maybe I should just say, we need to leverage all channels because there are existing ecosystems that we can tap into. And if we're smart about the mentions and the hashtags and the people that we connect with, all of these channels can be powerful. Let's just punch through a couple of these channels here. Facebook, the thing that's hot on Facebook right now is actually um, long videos, nine by 16 format or square videos. Let's all face it, our attention span on Facebook is extremely short. We only have a couple of seconds. 30, 60 second videos on Facebook, it's difficult to convert those. What we're seeing now is six to 15 second videos. Consider doing A-B tests of all those lengths and sizes, because that's gonna be probably where your money comes in from an ROI perspective. Um, YouTube, YouTube is actually really promoting now engaging, recurring, stimulating content. That's actually more longer form. 10 minute, I mean the videos that we produce for Dub, they're almost 10 minutes. We did a video, we, did, we actually did a video masterclass that we dropped yesterday on YouTube at Dub App and it was a 10 minute video. And it was me in my car and it was me at some cool place in, in Silicon Valley that was just kind of shooting random scenes and teaching video marketing. Um, YouTube likes long form content. Now that said, there needs to be some production value because if there isn't production value and you're just putting uh, a, a webcam shot or sort of a still shot that's long, it's difficult to actually grab people's connection. Unless, of course, you've got that personality and that's where people can, can really engage. If you look at any of the, the big vloggers that have a million plus followers, if you go back and look at their stuff from uh, you know, three years ago or five years ago when they first started, it, sometimes it's 10 minute rants where they're just at the airport or in their basement or just on a curbside just sharing a story. 
So as long as there's a personality, as long as there's engaging, informational, delightful content, long form content is totally embraced on YouTube. Try it, it works. Instagram is amazing, it's unreal. There's no tar, I mean, everyone's on Instagram, right? Age three to 103 or 133. Um, the thing that is really popping off on Instagram right now is IGTV. So raise your hand if you're on IGTV or if you've ever published a video to IGTV. Okay, cool. So it, this is an early, early, early time for IGTV. It is a, it's a hot time to get into IGTV right now. It's like a gold rush, okay? They're going through some pivots, they're changing. At first, the, the format size was actually, you had, you had to have a video in nine by 16. And just very recently, within the last month, they made it so that you can put a, a 16 by nine video on IGTV. And the reason why IGTV is very relevant is because Instagram caps you at a 60 second limit on Instagram, they've done that since, since video was announced on Instagram. With IGTV, you can put longer form content, which means you can put full episodes, walk and talks, in informational videos, personality videos. That's the theme here. Twitter has video now. Um, I think it caps you at um, a minute and 20 seconds, if I'm not mistaken, or is it two minutes? I don't recall. Um, the cool thing about Twitter is that if you, if you have access to Twitter Studio, you can actually put longer form content on there. Now, I'm mentioning long form content a lot. I'm not saying that you should really focus on long form content unless you can focus on it. But Twitter is actually a good, good means for videos in general. Um, we actually use Twitter Promote, which is a $99 a month service. And it has an algorithm, which is a little bit of a black box, but it puts your videos out front and center um, on the relevant um, hashtags. So consider checking out Twitter Promote. The verdict is still not out. If you Google it, there's a lot of information that says, well, does it work, does it not work? I mean, our videos um, will get hundreds or thousands of views with, um, with our small audience and then with Twitter Promote. So consider checking that out. Um, LinkedIn is powerful for video. LinkedIn is probably the new, LinkedIn is the newest player with video, okay? And they've done a phenomenal job at it. So please raise your hand if you've put a video on your, on your personal LinkedIn page. Okay, cool, and then um, please raise your hand if you've done a video on your LinkedIn company page. Okay, cool, so I see a lot more adoption when it comes to the company page. The reality is that um, we're, profile pages get 10x the engagement of a company page because it's people, right? I mean, we don't really follow companies. I mean, maybe we do just to kind of see what's going on if we wanna see a product announcement, but I always wanna know what people are up to. So one of the sort of tricks that I think people are doing now is that they're just, assuming the role of the spokesperson for their company. And they're just documenting the things that they're already doing, whether it's team meetings or product announcements. I mean, for a lot of people, it's actually re replaced the press release. Now it's just a video. Um, the cool thing about LinkedIn is that if you do it right, you can get a lot of traction because LinkedIn is promoting video like crazy. Why are they doing that? Because they're getting ready to start selling video advertising. When Microsoft announces the video advertising thing on LinkedIn, it's gonna be crazy. People are gonna be spending a, a lot of money. Now, you can, you can advertise with video on LinkedIn right now, that is possible, but not like it is on Facebook and not like it is on YouTube. That is coming, and when that happens, it's gonna be crazy. Um, it is a very good time to get into LinkedIn from a video perspective, okay? Just a couple of best practices, let's just knock these out. Number one is have a thumbnail graphic. Um, you can do it from your company, pump, company page, you cannot do that from your personal page. So from your company page, either throw something together um, in whatever programmer you use or just grab a still from your video and then upload that to the company page. From your personal page, you're gonna have to, basically the, the hack here is that the first frame of the video has to be the thumbnail graphic, because that's kind of important. So figure out a way to, to make your first frame kind of pop in your video so that when people see it, it's not you closing your eyes or you know, your camera pointing at a carpet or something like that. Make sure it's interesting. Um, those videos do autoplay, but it still takes a couple of seconds, so that's important. Um, closed caption, you know, SRT files. Please raise your hand if you're adding closed caption files to your video. Okay, so not so much adoption here. Guys, it's critical that you do this, okay? Why is it critical that we add captions to our videos? Please, please, someone answer that question. It makes them searchable. What? It makes them searchable. That's awesome, that's an SEO thing. That's totally true. Right there, 
sound. The vast majority of the video that we're watching on the internet doesn't have the sound on. That's kind of an oxymoron. But it makes sense. I mean, do you guys remember like 10 years ago when you went to a website and there was that little figure on the bottom right of the site who just started talking and you're like, where is that coming from? And you have 10 tabs open. You're like, stop it, make it stop. And you just close your whole browser. I, that caused a whole movement now. Chrome um, actively mutes all videos. Like on Dub, we have an autoplay option, but it only works about maybe 40% of the time because Chrome, the browser that most of us use, they actually block audio. So captions are critical. There's a couple of really easy ways to do it. Number one, on Facebook, if you upload a video, it will automatically generate an SRT file for you. Okay, so that's completely free. It's not perfect. It's algorithmic. You have to go in, you have to make edits, you have to make changes. But the cool thing is that within, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes, it'll auto produce that. And then depending on the length of your video, you can get in there, make your tweaks, download the file, and then upload that to LinkedIn. So that's something that we do every day on the videos that we publish. Every single day, we go through that process. Um, uh, we, we use a service called rev.com, R-E-V.com, not sponsored by them, I'm just throwing them out there. Um, they have a human service where they actually go and listen to your video, you know, manually create the SRT file. It's kind of, kind of cool how they get it really right. Like if you have, like we have beatboxing in some of our videos, and um, they'll actually write like beatboxing. YouTube, uh, you know, the YouTube algorithm will never figure that out. So it's kind of cool. They put little music notes. I'm a musician, so I kind of enjoy that. Um, but yeah, so LinkedIn, um, consider pushing on LinkedIn because right now it's, it's, it's the golden age, really. It's, it's an amazing time to get in on LinkedIn. Um, calls to action on all of these are critical. Always have a link. If you can, use a trackable link. Please, a show of hands, how many people are using UTM parameters in your URLs? All right, so I'd say moderate adoption for, U, for UTM parameters. You, if you don't know what that is, please Google it. It's a very simple practice that's been around for a number of years. And it's basically a parameter system where you can append your source, your medium, your campaign, your content, and then your term to the URL. So depending on what your CRM is or depending on what the tech that you have, when people sign up, when they fill out a form, when they convert, when they buy something on your website, even if they call you, there's tracking for that. You can actually know what the attribution was. You can say, hey, the six second video on Facebook on campaign XYZ actually drove this conversion. And that's hot because without that, you're not gonna get your data tracking. Making video is about being creative and it's about sharing stories, but it's also about really being smart. We're gonna get into that. Um, email is, is not dead. Email is hot. Email is still what we all use. We all have an email account. We all check it every single day. Um, yeah, it's probably slammed. I mean, I, at one point, I think I had 100,000 unread emails in one of my uh, accounts, which of course I deleted. But, you know, we all know that story, right? How do you punch through the noise on email? We're going to get to that in a second. Um, the point, though, is that email is a very good method to distribute videos. So you might be asking, well, how do you send a video on an email, that, that doesn't make any sense. Well, here's how, it's actually a really simple trick. What you do is that you create a three to six second animated GIF of your video. You can do, there's a lot of free sites, there's all sorts of really ugly, really crappy sites where you can do this. You upload your video, you slap your little YouTube link in there, um, you put you know six images and it'll auto-produce an animated GIF. Giphy.com has that. Um, I think there's another one called Easy GIF, which we use sometimes. Um, and that will create a three to six second animated GIF. That GIF then is a little preview. It's a little, it's a little nugget. It's a little you know, honey for that, that you can place in your email so that when you broadcast that email, either on a one-to-one -one or a campaign basis, you give the person a, a taste, a teaser, a visual of what they're about to see. That's pretty cool. How many people are using animated GIFs in their email campaigns? Okay, cool. So that's countable on one hand, probably. Um, when we started to do that in our email campaigns, it was easily, easily a five to six x, six, um, x increase in our click rates, it, easily. Because people are like, well, I kind of have to watch that. And then we went down this whole path where we added these personalization components where you can actually add the person's name um, to the thumbnail graphic. And that's where we saw a crazy increase. Um, but if you're not doing animated GIFs, which it sounds like you're not, please consider that because it works. Um, video for sales. So um, I think that we all know that the era of the, you know, the alpha sales man guy 
I want to be politically correct here, you know, that, that boiler room, that keep grinding, you know, that, that like leaderboard thing, those days are getting numbered. It's hard to do sales like what they used to do back in the good, good old days, you know? Now it's about providing value. It's about being a consultant, being a friend, you know? The reason why I think women are doing so well in sales right now is because maybe they approach this different from the male perspective. Now, I know I'm being a little bit sort of gender biased here, but screw it, I'll go for this. You know, I think we have to be nurturing. I think we have to be caring and really want to help the person and want to see them succeed, not say, oh, well, how, how am I gonna pay the next uh, lease payment on my, on my Lamborghini, you know? We really have to come at this from an educational perspective. Video allows us to do that. I think there's really two ways that I'll share that video can, can help you in your sales. So number one is simple webcam, simple phone videos that you send to people. We built our company based on being able to do that, right? It's a team-based platform. You know, individual people can send these videos out. They create them within seconds, direct integration into Gmail. Why did we do that? Why did we spend all this money to create this tech, to be able to send an email through LinkedIn and Gmail? The reason is because the problem is trust. Sales now, the first step of sales is about building trust. It's not even about providing value. It's not about what you offer, what you've done, what you, where you went to school, what your, what your value proposition is. Can I trust you as a human being? If I put my credit card on the line, if I put my reputation on the line, if I put my job on the line, are you gonna provide some value to me? You know? So, I mean, a lot of us are marketers, but we, you know, we're also salespeople because now it's, there's no such thing as sales and marketing. It's all smarketing now, <laughs> you know? So, um, so video is really powerful when it comes to building trust. So, you know, grab that phone, grab that device, get some tech, get yourself set up. Dub has a free account if you want to grab one. If not, find another way, but just do it because it really works. Um, the other thing is screen videos, right? So people want to see proof, social proof, social validation. It's become a cliche. It's a term that we all use now as marketers, right? Showing and not telling. I mean, that's what Scorsese says in, in his filmmaking. That applies to us as marketers. It's about showing and not telling, right? Creating a screen video can do so many things. It can show someone how your product works. It can show you know, that you're on their website, that you're doing an, I don't know, an SEO analysis on their site. You know, I, I remember early on, we used to do screen videos in a, in a past life where we would go into the source code and we would say, hey, all your metadata is incorrect. It's not, you're not getting good SEO juice on this. You're not gonna get good social shares. And when people saw that, you know, they just, they reacted. They said, wow, thank you so much. So, thank you so much for showing, you know, under the hood for my business. Now I can correct this. So it built a lot of trust for us. So I think these are two things that can start to help you as either salespeople or you know, sales supporters or sales enablers, because frankly, we're all of that. It doesn't matter how big the company is. Um, this is an example of, of an animated GIF. It's terribly pixelated. That's, I mean, it's crazy. GIFs are like a 25-year-old, almost 30-year-old technology, and we still use them. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> um, we like emojis. Um, I don't know if people like emojis. Um, okay, so data tracking. Let's get into data. So um, how many of you guys consider yourself data-driven marketers? Just a show of hands, please. All right, I'd like to open up the mic just a little bit. Do we have that floater? Is that thing on? Um, just tap it. Okay, cool. So that guy's on. So all right, so I want to hear what you, I'm a data geek. I, I just get so excited when it comes to data, and I can share all my stories with data. I want to hear what you guys are doing for data tracking, for data reporting. So if we have some courageous ones. Please, this is a really good opportunity to brand yourself. You. you know, people are going to see that you grab the mic. Um, anyone have courage? To, oh, boom. No, he's actually the staff. Okay, so I need, I need someone with courage right now to tell me what you're using for data, or I'm going to assume that there are no data-driven marketers here, or we're all shy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we use a, a handful of different different tools. Let's to, hear the stack. To track data. <laughs> so uh, we use UTMs. So that's kind of core one. We use UTMs both in Google Analytics to track traffic to our our publication site and the rest of our web pages. But then we also use it integrated in Marketo, which is our marketing automation software. Nice. So we track on both. So we track uh, through UTMs on both of those. Uh, we also 
use a, another service. I don't know what it's called because I don't manage it, but it's able to, to pull in data on our, from our uh, CRM system, which is outside of Marketo, to engage what our audience looks like based on um, various things that are important to us. So we're a, an association in the banking industry. We work with you know, various levels and types of folks, and so we're able to track who's coming from what types of organizations by size, by job function, by level. So we were able to target, okay, if we want to target bank marketers for a webinar that we have going on, we'll be able to reach out to those specific people by job type, by function. So that's kind of a, a brief of how we're able to, to use data to, you know, some of it. So. Very cool. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of services out there where you, when you grab your data and your UTM data, it actually can aggregate more data from third-party services to provide more valuable information, how big the company is, you know, how much revenue there is, how many employees there are. So there's a lot of way to like enrich your data. So that's that's very cool. Anyone else courageous to talk about data in a stack? Um, is it is it okay if I record this? Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. My name is Brina B R Y N A. Uh, I'm a um, digital marketing analyst working for Visit Florida. So I don't know if you guys have heard of uh, Visit Florida, which is the Florida State uh, Tourism Marketing Organization. So I'm probably, if I don't say the only one, probably the few of the uh, people in the uh, company actually knows a little bit about data. So a big part of my job is to try to embrace the data concept and convince my team that data, it is working. Actually, we, we need to know more about it and leverage um, the, the data's power to uh, better, how to say, improve our uh, performance and everything. Very cool, great to hear, yeah. Any other volunteers, maybe the last one? Cool. How are we doing on time? I haven't seen any cards. Unlimited? All right. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, activity reporting is, is also a really important thing. So, um, you know, I, I'm sort of an early HubSpot adopter. Uh, I went through their whole certification process years ago. And what I became enamored by was their user level data tracking. So, we're all used to macro data tracking. You know, what is the email open rate, what is the email click rate, what is the video watch rate, what is the conversion rate, we're all used to that, we've seen that data a lot. With tech, with CRMs like Marketo, I should say marketing automation systems, and, and so many others, now we can get granular about user level data, and that becomes really interesting, because if we can track people at either a campaign level or an individual level, we can increase the value of our prospects by 10 to 20x. You know, if we know who is engaging on our site, on our landing pages, on our forms, you know, we can, we can, we can make better decisions. And frankly, we can track the customer journey so that we can improve the overall experience. So if you're not using some sort of a user level tracking or customer journey tracking, this is something that you might consider getting into. Now, it's a little bit, it takes time, it takes a couple of months to kind of get into because you have to put certain tracking pixels and um, you know, it, the, there's no real privacy issues. I mean, unless maybe if you're in Europe, maybe there's some GDPR issues, but all the major platforms like HubSpot, Marketo, Eloqua, Agile CRM, you know, SharpSpring, all those guys use this type of tech. The thing that's really amazing about user level tracking is that you become a hero for your sales department, okay? I love, I've, it's always been something I've been very passionate about, but it's basically to go to a salesperson and say, I have some data that is gonna help you and me to hit quotas and to drive more revenue. That's always been something I've been very, very passionate about. And if you can figure out ways, either at, again, the campaign or the user level, to provide this type of tracking where you know who the individual person was that came to the site, who that person was that filled out the form or you know, made the phone call. If you can provide that information, all of a sudden you provide something to the salesperson which is called the, you know, the hot list, 
right? The hot, we all know about that. It's the hot list. It's the top 100 or top 1,000 or whatever it is. So that level of data is really, really going to help to drive revenue and frankly to make you be a hero because we're all about that. Um, this is just a graphic. Of, this is actually from the Dub platform that just shows um, the, the user level tracking. So what email they opened, what email they clicked, what video they watched, what percentage of the video, um, the call to action if it was clicked. So um, we got real deep into this. Um, here's a couple of key takeaways, okay? Um, produce consistent, high-quality content. Um, video is not about um, your 747 airplane. It's about your, your rocket ships. It's about your jets. It's about your balloons that you put out there. Get into a frequent process of doing this, both for yourself as an individual, because I promise you it'll help you in your career, but also from a company perspective. The only reason why I'm on this stage is because I threw a video out there somewhere. I don't remember which one it was, but someone saw some video where I was pretending to be cool and someone said, hey, I want you to come talk, and it worked out, right? So, you know, the power of video, there's this other sort of key takeaway. You know, when we watch a video of Oprah, we feel like we know her, okay? Oprah doesn't know us, okay? Maybe there's one person in here that knows Oprah, but I don't know Oprah, but when I see Oprah, on a video, I feel like I know her, right? It's built, some, video has the power to actually create a relationship, which is kind of, kind of neat if you think about it, right? So when we are in this process of creating videos on all these channels that we mentioned, we're building connections, we're, we're building trust. You know, we're getting people to connect with us, which is, which is in my opinion, the key to video marketing, connections. Um, you know, go Omni, you know? Get all the channels going. I mean, look, here's the deal. Whatever target audience you're catering to, that target audience is going to expire soon. You know, that sounds kind of scary, but it's the truth. I mean, people get older and they stop buying crap, right? When you're older, like my parents, they don't buy that much stuff anymore. You know, maybe a couple of key things, but they're in their, their thing. I mean, my dad, it took him like eight years to get a new iPhone, right? But the younger generations, they're the ones that are going crazy. It's like this whole idea of, you know, having everything but owning nothing. So, you know, Consider about broadening your, 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 your age groups and your demographics. I, I'm just going to throw that out there because we have, like I mentioned, someone that's going to be coming up on stage. Um, and then don't forget about the analytics, guys. Let's be data-driven, you know? We're all creative. This whole idea of being right-brained and left-brained, that's all garbage. If you, if you look at the new study on that, there's no, that's, that's all garbage. We're all dynamic people now that are constantly making decisions. You know, we're, we're making choices. We're able to you know, look at data, look at information, react to that, survive out there, and, and be who we are, right? So, don't ever find yourself stuck into a rut where you're like, you know what, I'm too creative, I'm too much of a right brain thinker. That's all garbage. Now we're all empowered through simple platforms and simple charts that are colorful and cool. They use, col they use cool colors now. Um, but get into that, you know, lean into that discomfort because that is where you're gonna figure out the information that will help you to make better choices. And that all makes us look really good. And of course helps our businesses grow. Um, so just a, a sort of a final point here. Um, you know, I want to talk about fear. I'm going to just pivot the combo for a second here. I want to talk about fear, right? So we all suffer from this syndrome called fear. Every single one of us. It's encoded into our <laughs> DNA, actually. And it's actually a survival tactic. The reason why we feel fear is to be able to protect ourselves. If we're out in the jungle and in the wild and we're, you know, attacked or threatened, fear will kick in and our reptilian will Will, brain will activate and we will make a choice. We'll either run, we'll, we'll, we'll grab a web, we'll do whatever we need to do to survive, right? The reality is that every single one of us, we're, we're sort of limited by fear, right? And what I mean by that is that the choices that we're making, the risks that we wanna take to go put that video out, to go put that LinkedIn video on the internet, to go you know, try a new um, you know, medium, a new channel, a new you know, crazy off the top concept for our commercial. We're limited by fear because when we make those risks, it puts our jobs on the line and it puts our reputation on the line. And I think that we are living in such an age where we can actually transcend from fear now because we can fail very fast. If you put a video out on the internet, you can pull that video off. This is not a TV spot from 10 years ago or 20 years ago where you just drop the 30 second spot that's going to the Super Bowl and you cannot change it. That is not the case anymore. It's literally pushing a button. 
and it's dead and you pivot and you fail quick and then you move on to the next thing. Fear is actually limiting us from being able to take the risks that will help us to do our jobs. I believe that if we go to our bosses or if we go to our customers or if we go to our clients and we say, hey, listen, we want to take a little bit of a risk. We want to try something out. As long as we're data-driven, as long as we're proficient, as long as we're professional about it, clearly communicate what our goals are and what our path is and maybe some fallback options, we're gonna get empowered. We're gonna get embraced. And as long as we document the whole thing, you know, for everyone that's involved, for all stakeholders, even if we fail, we're gonna look like heroes potentially. And the key though is to be data-driven, to figure out where the learning is, what the mistake was, and how to pivot into something that's actually gonna work. Fear can be overcome now, because fear now is a button that we can turn off. So that's something to think about. So, you know, there's, a, there's two topics that are really important here, okay? Number one is that, you know, our, our age groups, you know, I think, just a quick, quick raise of hand here. How many people are catering to millennials or younger for their target audience? Okay, cool. So maybe 30%, maybe more, maybe 40%. So here's what's really interesting is that millennials are, they're actually driving this movement, okay? Because if you think about how they, how they operate, you know, they have their phone in their pocket always, well, just like us but they hit record constantly, you know? They're snapping photos, they probably take 20 times more photos that we do, more videos. You know, that Snapchat, TikTok, you know, early Facebook, definitely Instagram culture, um, you know, Vine as well, those like six second boomerang clips, those things that you see all over. You know, that movement is really what catalyzed a lot of the video um, marketing movement, right? Because it's all about clicking a record and it's all about being authentic, being honest, not having fear, putting yourself out there, and then once it's done, you move on to the next thing. Video is ephemeral in many ways. Yes, it can be evergreen. Yes, it can exist on our library, but at the same time, you put it out there and it goes, okay? Um, so any questions, guys? We talked a about a lot of things. Yeah. yeah. Let's grab the mic here. I'll, I'll come down there. Okay, cool. I'll still come down there. Hi, can you talk about the value of a Facebook Live video relative to pre-recorded videos? And if closed captioning is important, how do you make that happen on a Facebook Live video? Yeah, so live video is, um, it's a big movement. Thank you for that question, that's really good. Um, I actually didn't talk about live video at all, um, which is probably remiss on my part. Um, so let's, let's get into it. All right, so live video is now available on, let's see, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter. So I think everyone now has live video. So there isn't a video platform or a social network out there that does not have live video. Um, there's a reason for that, because live is the most authentic thing that we can share with someone, something that's happening right then and there. The reality with live video is that it's hard to get those live videos to, to be an evergreen asset. Okay, and what I mean by that is that when you throw a live video out there, it's probably something that's gonna be event-based. Something is happening, it's an announcement, a ribbon is being cut, something is going on, right? So event-based videos are, are great for live videos, right? We completely, completely, uh, you know, believe in that model. The, the reality though, and, and I will say this, is that all of these social networks algorithmically are promoting live videos so aggressively right now because everyone believes in it, right? Um, if you put a, a Facebook Live video out there, you're gonna get bumped to the top of the feed and a lot of people are gonna see you. You, you might have noticed that if you've done it. And then you'll get some likes and people will join in and then they'll drop out, right? Right now though, the reality about live video is that we're all enamored with the idea of live video, but I don't know if it's fully, fully, fully taken off to the level that I think the big social networks have expected it to, right? It's hot, but it's not that hot, right? So I wanna answer your question. Um, I think that, you know, captioning is, is, is really important. We talked about everything being on mute. A lot of the times, probably most of the times I'm watching a live video, I'll spend the first 15 to 20 seconds just seeing what's happening. You know, wherever the person is, I won't really read it. I'll kind of look at the comments. I'll look at the engagement and, and then I'll make my choice, right? Um, so I think the captions is really important. I think it's important to put it out there, but there's a lot of limitations because now you're doing real time closed captioning, which, you know, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but a lot of the times the computers mess it up and the words get all fumbled up, 
which kind of maybe it looks bad, right? So there's a lot of limitations with, with um, you know, Facebook Live. The, one of the things that we, we always say at Dub is that you sort of have to embrace the medium. Whatever the constraints are for that particular channel is what you need to be doing. There's no way you're going to get perfect closed captioning on, on, on live video. It's not, it's not going to happen, right? Um, there's no way that you're going to figure out a way so that everyone joins into the video right at the beginning. It's going to be a stream of information that people kind of slowly, slowly join, right? You need to figure out ways to live within this constraint. For example, when we do live videos, we'll, every 30 seconds, we'll, send up, we'll sort of remind people what we're doing. Hey guys, just a quick recap, we're doing X, Y, and Z, so that the new people that came in know what the heck is going on, right? Um, the other thing is that, you know, that video is, it will live and it will go back to your social network, right? Wherever it is. And on most of them, you can't clip it. You can't cut it. Now on YouTube, they have trimming options, but a lot of the other ones, you can't like trim that once you've recorded it. So now let's say that you have, you know, a 30 minute or a 15 minute video, but there's only really three core minutes of good footage. Is that the best asset that you can put out there on Facebook to have this very, very long video with just a little bit snippet of information in the middle? Probably not. You know, make sure you save your live videos and then go and recut those and turn them into, you know, an asset that you can put on social or something that's, uh, you know, evergreen that lives on one of your pages. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah, please. Oh, okay. Oh. You're ready? <laughs> Um, so I actually have two questions. Okay. Um, the first one is in the list of where you're saying to share video, share content. Uh, I noticed you didn't put the website. Like, if someone has a website, do you putting those videos on the website? Yeah. Um, do you recommend that or no? And then my second question is, whenever you're doing the data analytics how long do you give before you decide this isn't working, we need to change something else? It's two weeks, a month, so. Got it, yeah. Um, you know, videos on websites are amazing. On pretty much every page on dub.com, we have a video. It's just something that we decided to do. Every page of our dashboard has an explanation YouTube video. Our homepage has one. Our features video, our features page has one. So, um, you know, we're, we're totally bullish on video on websites. It works like a champ. Keep them short, keep, keep them concise. You know, if, if you have someone, if you have their attention for, you know, X number of minutes, don't consume all of that having them watch a video. Get to the point and then, again, take them down that funnel. So thank you for calling me out on that. You're totally right. Um, number two is about um, data tracking and timeliness of data tracking. So, um, you know, when we look at data tracking, it really depends on the campaign. So the smaller the campaign, the shorter the, the, shorter the time length um, that it will take us for actually go in and to look at data. So if we're doing a campaign to 10 high value prospects, we're going to go that day. At the end of the day, maybe we send an email campaign out, we're going to see what happened. And then we're going to sort of get some learnings and then pivot based on that. Um, but if it's a larger campaign, maybe a larger email campaign or maybe a social thing, you know, I like to go in at least weekly to kind of see what's going on. Um, it's, it's difficult though because you have to get learnings. You have to get a large enough sample size with enough impressions, enough clicks to, you know, A, have the data make sense, but then B, have um, the, the systems be able to sort of parse the data and then, and then to provide recommendations. Because, of course, Google has that, Facebook has that. So, you know, I say either daily, weekly, or monthly, um, depending on the size of the campaign. Um, and then I think a quarterly, you know, full recap with full reports shared with the entire team is critical because that's where you're going to say, hey, what are we going to do next quarter? You know? So. I have to say that you guys are so much more engaging than the LA audience. It's, just, it's great. I mean, you guys are, you know, I love the questions. Yeah. Uh, so I work mainly as a video content creator for a university, but a oh, lot nice. of it isn't data driven. Okay. And so if we wanted to integrate that into our process, what would be some maybe introductory tools? Like we don't have a stack of anything, frankly. Got it. Um, okay. So what would be some introductory things you would recommend to learn more about video traffic in particular. Well, first I'll ask you a question. So how do you decide to make a video? What makes you want to make that video? Um, there's usually a client need. Somebody within the college needs some buzz about something. Okay, got it. Um, cool. So then what, what is the goal? Is it recruiting or is it? Uh, you know, it varies. Sometimes okay. it's a call to action to join a group or to volunteer. Sometimes we're just trying to get maybe a lecture or just 
get the word out about an, uh, an event. Okay, got it. So, you know, there's a couple of different types of videos that you can test for that. So you can simply A-B test the format. So format is the first thing, right? Um, there could be two completely different um, versions of it. One of them can be, you know, a selfie vlog style video where someone is capturing an event or something that's happening. Maybe they're holding the phone. You know, maybe it's something super casual, super personable. Um, but then the second one would be something that's more traditional, you know, corporate promo, you know, the larger shots, um, the, the, the sort of the wide shots with a lot of lifestyle stuff. Um, and then maybe even a third version, which is, you know, a hybrid of those two, right? So I think format is the first thing that you can A-B test. What, what is the data that you can actually look at to figure out which one is getting more engagement? Well, there's YouTube, which is great. It's free, right? So you can figure out, you can look in the analytics of YouTube, you can see what the watch time is, because watch time is one of the most critical things on a YouTube video. What percentage of the video did people get through? And you can actually see where people kind of dropped off. And that's really important because that drop off is where people got bored or people lost trust or where people made a choice or they got distracted. So that those data points um, on the, the video sort of engagement side is really gonna help you as a creator to figure out the, the, the format um, that you should best pursue. Um, I think the other one is the length. You know, How long should the video be? I keep talking about short form content and long form content, right? There's no rules here. I mean, there's different lengths for every single campaign. No one can tell you that a 12 second video is gonna convert better than a 60 second one. It all depends on so many things, the audience and the, you know, the affinity components and the, the placements and the campaigns and so on and so forth. So you know, when you go in and you create your video, say, I'm gonna actually go in and create, I'm gonna have four exports. I'm gonna do a six second, I'm gonna do a 12, I'm gonna do a 15 and I'm gonna do a 30 and maybe even a two minute one. That's like a follow-up thing after the person fills out the form or something, right? So, you know, length is another thing that you can A-B test. Um, I think another thing is the, the ratio, right? So we 16-9, traditional letterbox, it's been around forever. Um, that's a 16-9 screen. That's what everyone's doing. Guess what? When you have a square or a 9 by 16 video, you occupy almost basically 2x the space. So if your video is like this on Facebook, when someone is scrolling, they're not seeing the distraction below your video. Do you realize that? It's kind of interesting. I mean, they're just focused on your video. It gives you about an inch or two of more real estate. That's very valuable, especially if you're putting dollars behind that video. So a lot of people might say, I hear this all the time. A lot of people say, well, we don't have the money to export different versions of our video in nine by 16. And I say, okay, fine. You're gonna go spend that money and you're gonna give it to Facebook and you're gonna give it to, you know, Inst Instagram, Facebook, and you're going to give it to, um, does Google, no, Google doesn't have 9 by 16. Um, Twitter, Twitter has some variations, which people should look into. But the point is, is that you can spend the money on the export, on the production, or you can spend it in the advertising. I say, you know, get your multiple assets so that you can A-B test as early on as possible. Um, so th there's, those are just a couple of points for you. Yeah. Any sort of final, final question as we wrap? I think we have about three minutes. Yeah. You got two. Um, this is actually two simple questions. One, you said that for uh, email marketing, you should turn it into an automated GIF. How, oh, how animated you, GIF, yeah. yeah uh -huh. how, how do you do that? Okay, so I'll, I'll give you, this is a blitz, I'll give you two methods right now. Okay, you have a video on YouTube, you go to giphy.com. How do you spell that? G-I-P-H-Y. G-I-P-H-Y. Yeah, .com. you input the URL of the YouTube video. And then there's an automatic um, generator. So you can oh, kind of, great. you know, sort of on the timeline, figure out exactly um, what clip you want to export. And then just export that. You can throw a little graphic on there if you want. Um, side note, when you do put images on Giphy and you tag them with your URL or your name, you're, you're putting content out there on the internet. Giphy is, is a search engine. Giphy is all over. We all have it on our Google and, and Apple phones, right? So one of the things that sometimes when we do is when we have a YouTube video, we'll throw it up on Giphy, we'll parse it into little bits and pieces and have tiny little animated GIFs um, that is on Giphy that is searchable. So if someone types in video marketing, maybe it'll be a picture of me you know, dancing like a robot, you know, and that'll be the Giphy. So it's just a little bit of a little content source there. So the second one is a site called easygif.com, which is the ugliest website you'll ever see. We use it a lot. It was built 10 years ago, but it works very well, Easy GIF. Um, and then you upload your MP4, MOV, AVI, and then go through the whole process. You can crop, you can 
um, and so on and so forth. So just make sure that it's less than two megs. That's what we recommend, two megabytes. Less, make sure that your animated GIF is less than two megabytes. If it's more than that, it's gonna take forever to load in the person's email, bad practice. Right, and then the other thing was for, you said for Facebook, it should be like six to 15 seconds. So do you just kind of reformat your video so it's short? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the smartest I, I think the smartest thing to do in the creation process is to know what your exportable lengths are going to be, right? And, and actually also your ratio size, because when you do that, then you can capture the right amount of content in the right amount of time. So, um, you know, when I said that, you know, 615 work on Facebook, again, you got to test everything. You know, two minute videos are still working in some cases if they're good stories. Um, but you know, it's an attention deficit issue. So um, I would say, you know, go in knowing that you're gonna create a short video, be concise. It actually really helps the creative process when you have that constraint. You know, when you're writing a script or you're going through something, having constraints as creative people actually empowers us. Because if we say we need to do a video within 12 seconds, it becomes easier, not more difficult. So, yeah. Um, I'll just wrap if there's a final question. You guys, thank you so much for your, oh, we got a final one. Hi, so we actually do a lot of video advertising on social platforms, on YouTube, and we drive a lot of traffic to our website, but I was just wondering in your opinion, should you be creating custom landing pages for the videos you're creating that also include the video itself and then just a call to action on that page? Or do you do a mix of both? I'm so passionate about that question. I wish I had 10 minutes to answer this. Um, I'll tell you everything I know in 60 seconds. Okay, landing pages are so critical for the video. It's not even funny. You know, you can't just put a video on some, some random um, landing page or your homepage and expect for it to convert. Why? Because it's an attention problem. When you're sending someone down to a website, you're sending them down a funnel. You've got, you know, X number of minutes to have them learn, build trust, you know, feel some sort of empathy, understand that there's some value proposition, something that can help them in, in their lives, and then the inspiration to convert. That's a lot of tasks, right? So um, your custom landing page is so critical for doing that. I believe in this so much that we actually spent months building out a whole landing page system specific for videos. It's a thing on Dub, but we put a lot of data into it. We put a lot of effort because we realized that when people just slapped up a video on a random landing page, it didn't convert as well as a specific one for the video. So typically, the ones that we like that work the best for us, it's a, it's a hero message, it's a video, um, it's a call to action, it's a little bit more of an explanation, it's social proof, which is like logos, um, you know, trust badges, and then contact information, and then sub navigation links. That's the thing that works for us. So. Try, try it out for yourself. Um, you know, email me and let me know uh, what you came up with. Today we're gonna be talking about video. Now, these slides have too much content on them, so ignore them. Just, this is all about, it's a very verbal, very vocal thing. We're gonna be sharing this material as well, so I don't think there's any need in taking notes whatsoever. So I'd love to make this as interactive and as fun. I really wanna understand what you guys are doing, what your goals are, and how video can potentially help you guys. So we're gonna talk about creation, we're gonna talk about production, distribution on social channels, um, emailing, and then also some data tracking, okay? So um, video marketing is, it's really the future. I mean, if anyone has been on a social wall recently, you've realized that it's taken over the feeds, right? Everyone is using video now. Why is that? I wanna take a step back and to really explain why video has taken over. Um, it's actually, a, there's a neural reason as to why video is a preferred method of communication. It's based on the fact that when we are trying to understand information, that we in our brains are trying to connect things and to connect stories and to connect issues that we have, connect trust, you know, ha seek empathy. There's all sorts of things that are happening. The reality though is that they, those things don't necessarily happen when we're reading text or we're looking at simple imagery. The reason why video is so effective is because it might be obvious, but it's because it connects all of our neural lapses and allows us to really understand something at a very visceral, very deep level. And that's powerful, right? In my opinion, the biggest problem on the internet is trust. Right now, we suffer from this problem where we don't trust things when we see them, whether it's information from a salesperson or it's a promotional video 
or it's a video that's overproduced, that seems like it's got too much money behind it, we don't have trust in it. That's why we're constantly seeking referrals and reviews and social proof and things that are very real in nature. So, you know, we as video marketers or as communicators or as business people, we have this powerful medium, video, that we can use. Now, of course, the problem is that it's difficult, at, at least it historically has been difficult to create, produce, distribute, and track. So we'll get into that in a second. So the first thing I want to say is that video marketing is not, it's not about commercially produced videos anymore. All of us can grab our phones right now, do videos on the fly, and those videos sometimes are more powerful than the produced ones. You'll see really big banks, you know, well-known companies that are finding some person, a spokesperson, that maybe have influence or maybe not, and to grab a phone or grab a simple device, record a video, and then convert that into an evergreen asset that lives maybe on a YouTube channel, on a blog post, or even a 12 or 15 second Facebook ad. We're all very empowered right now to start to record video in a format that works for us. The big thing here is to be consistent about it. So, you know, five or seven years ago, a lot of people, a lot of marketers especially, would think that they needed to come up with some amazing produced video that's going to get them a million views, and then that's going to make everyone rich, and their boss is going to be happy, and, you know, the funnel is going to be full. Those days still exist, but it's kind of like winning the lottery, you know? What, video marketers might tell you in this day and age is to actually just try to get into a cadence. Come up with content, put it out there, rinse and repeat, collect your data, and just continue to do that over and over and over again. It's a repetitive effort. It doesn't take as much time from a production standpoint, but you're getting eyeballs. You know, there's different ways to get a million views. You can have one video that gets a million views, or you can have a hundred or a thousand videos that get a million views. It's up to you guys as to how many videos you want to produce and what your cadence is going to be. So another thing that's kind of changed here is that people now, there's been so much garbage and so much information, our inboxes are full, that we are inundated with data. And it's very difficult to make sense of all of this. You know, it's media overload. When you drive down Hollywood Boulevard, close to where we work, there's billboards everywhere, and we start to tune those out. The same thing is happening on social channels. We're all tuning out information left and right. We might not know it, we might know it, but it's a fact, right? So as communicators, we need to find ways to punch through that, you know, to make it so that people can actually trust us, communicate, and then provide some value. So a lot of people, me included, say that value is the solution there teach someone something, educate them, entertain them, give them something that they want, not that you want them to have. It's a very important distinction. People want to be educated, they want to be entertained, they want to be delighted, they want to see an iPhone get dipped into paint. That's what they want, let's give that to them. Because if they get that, then they're gonna engage, they're going to respond, they're going to want to get to know you and potentially convert, right? So how many people in this room here want to learn how to create videos to drive sales. I think we all want to do that, right? We're all here, there's, all, there's some business that we're associated with, and we all want to figure out a way to make video help us convert sales. Um, let's get into that. Okay, um, you know, we talked about this. You know, um, video production does not have to be overproduced anymore. In fact, sometimes that can hurt you, right? Because what it does is that it puts a layer between you and the viewer that makes them think that you are inaccessible, that you're overpriced, that you're corporate America. You know, brands now are associating with individuals. You know, the people are really the new brands. If you look at all these great companies, they're finding a spokesperson. It could be an employee, it could be a hired gun, it could be someone that represents them as a company. And then the startups, the smaller companies that have taken off and grown, have had faces to represent those brands. So, you know, we as individuals, we as small business owners or up and coming or even larger companies, we have the ability to leverage the human asset, the human element, the human story telling capability to go and connect with people using video. That does not require an expensive video. Um, you know, another thing that's critically important here is that I can't tell you how many times I see this where people have a video that don't have a funnel in mind. They don't have a call to action. There's a video, there's an expression, there's no, you know, empathy, there's no path to a conversion. 
very important to think about that. Now, I don't think that should be the first thing. I think that should be one of the things. But it is important to realize that when you create a video that you are moving people down a funnel and give them a clear call to action. People would actually prefer to have a clear call to action than have something be evasive or misunderstood or something that's a little bit difficult to kind of, you know, really pinpoint. Um, commercial production, just a little backstory here. So at, at Dub, at my company, um, we started to produce these videos. We started to overproduce them. I remember when we started to shoot these, we'd have three cameras and we'd have a crew and we'd have all these great things. And we realized that it was not scalable and it would take us a long time to get these done because there was editing and production and post-production and sound and all sorts of stuff. And what we realized was that we just needed to start shooting and we needed to start putting our content on all the social channels and that's where we saw a lot more lift. And quite frankly, it just released a lot of toll and a lot of stress from us. Thank you, Ruben. Huge round of applause for Ruben for the first half. He'll be back up. <laughs> Awesome. So distribution. So just a little bit about my background. Um, I started making videos at the age of 10 years old. Uh, I found a Macintosh computer, first GarageBand, which was audio editing, and then iMovie, which was video editing. And I just loved it. It was my passion. Um, I just made weird little videos. I love when I discovered you could reverse a video. I, my mind was blown. I could like make a like a, a whole bunch of marbles like fly up into the air, and it was it was it was an amazing moment for me. And that was like, wow, the power of this! I can essentially manipulate time, and I can manipulate reality. Um, and so I, I kept doing that. And then Twitter came out, and 11 years ago, I joined Twitter, and I was on there. And just the intersection of technology and content, I was like, wow, this is so cool. And as I kept going, this kind of content ended up becoming like the pillar of, of what uh, marketing, digital marketing is. Now, that, that's kind of at the center of all this. Um, and I didn't actually go into marketing initially. At the age of 16, I was on film sets um, through family connections, because in LA, it's all about who you know. I was able to like kind of weasel my own way onto film sets, start doing data management, DIT, um, which is basically backing up data working my way up, assistant editor, uh, then editing, um, which is my passion. And so I've seen firsthand the scale of what content creation used to, used to be. Huge teams, like I remember doing this one commercial shoot, it was like 15 seconds long, someone just walking up and being like, hello, how are you doing? Um, and it took, you know, a huge team, a truck, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, a micro budget film is considered like $250,000. You know, so, and that was, what, like seven years ago. In that time, everything has completely changed. Um, and I've kind of, I've witnessed that myself. The job that I'm doing at Dub, which is just making content marketing, I'm just one person, but that would have had, to, that would have taken at least like f 10 people, just one job. And the reason that I'm able to do that is because of all these tools and that's you know the way that Premiere Pro has evolved, the way that um, cameras have evolved, like just this tiny camera right here does 4K. Um, so now, just as as one person commented over there, these especially in LA, we're in this sort of realm where now people are trying to convince, oh, okay, now you have to spend a ton of money to make content, um, and when the reality is you can just start making it yourself. Yes, is, you, know, you want to make something that's higher produced, you get a team, and you, know, you want to distribute it, you get a team, and that might be higher quality, but really, you should just start right now, just with, there's, there's no excuse to pull out a phone and, and just try things, make, as, make things, make as much as you can. Um, and, and a huge part of that, you know, and <laughs> if, if that was the case 10 years ago as well, there would be nowhere to go. Like, if it was easy to make and cheap to make content, as it is now, there's nowhere to put that. Well, now there, not only is it cheap to make content, there's also a thousand places you can put that content also at low cost. So you can take out your phone, record a video that's just like, hey guys, I'm here, um, just you know, check out my product, super authentic, talking about that, and then you can put it everywhere. So, not, so that's, that's really the power of so getting onto distribution. Um, that's where distribution comes in. So you can make, I mean, 
there's so many ways to make it sound complex. You can say, oh, oh, I'm a, I'm a marketing agency, and we can leverage the Facebook and you know YouTube and Instagram. Yes, you can you can do all that, but it, it really is is it comes down to just simple, basic tenets of what works nowadays as far as distribution: just consistency, quality, and getting out as many places as possible, and not being locked in to the old models. So if you were like looking at YouTube, you found out about YouTube, you started posting that for five years, then uh, you know an app called Vine comes around, you don't go on that. Maybe you missed that whole wave. Um, and then, of course, Vine shuts down. So you're like, oh, well, I, good thing I didn't get into Vine. Well, someone else who decided to choose Vine, decided to take a chance on that app, they could have parlayed, they could have used the kind of organic growth that happened on that platform and parlayed that into all the other channels. So I'm not going to tell you I have any secret for content distribution. It's, it's literally just being open to the fact that these tools are out there and that there isn't really a barrier to entry. Anyone who tells you there's a barrier to entry to any digital distribution platform is maybe maybe they're trying to sell you something and that's fine. That's you know trying to make a business, but really you should and it's work, but you can outsource that. The work is uploading to a YouTube, to an Instagram, to a Facebook, um, to LinkedIn. Um, and then, you know, there's technical details. I think the biggest part is really keeping up with the trends. I think it's actually, it's less, it's less about some kind of secret sauce, and it's just being knowledgeable. It's maybe, maybe if you're yourself, you're not as tapped into this ever-changing world, it's finding someone that you work with or in your community who is on Twitter every day and who knows that YouTube just changed their algorithm, and now 10-minute videos are preferred. Or you know now actually you know, I think that's actually common knowledge now. Everyone's like, oh, make videos that are 10 minutes. Well, the emerging creators, the trends that I'm seeing now, is that it's not just 10 minute length. It's actually watch time that's preferred. So now it's not just making 10 minute videos. It's making 20 minute videos, and that'll bring the average watch time to around 10 minutes. Um, and, you know it was it was publicized that YouTube switching from views to watch time is the preferred metric. But, um, but so, and, and now they're actually <laughs> tweaking it again to prefer long-term reoccurring and satisfied viewership. So this is beyond watch time. This is actually, are they coming back to your channel? Are they uh, actually satisfied? So they're gonna use things like ratings and polls, other you know, <laughs> amazing algorithms to kind of actually measure, are you satisfied after watching? Are you coming back? And how long are you watching? So that means there's a, there's a pivot that's happening not only from these high dollar productions to more authentic in your pocket productions, there's also a pivot from these kind of flashy clickbaity videos to, to con and I think this is actually something that all the speakers have talked about today. You know, it's about the creative in the sense that, and maybe what I can elaborate on that, is that the creative is actually truly value add. It's truly meaningful. The creative doesn't have any slant of like, oh, well, I'm making this creative because I have an agenda or I'm trying to sell you something. The modern audiences, they can tell so easily when you distribute on these very intimate platforms. Like their friends that they met, you know, their cousin's friend is also competing with your post. So they have the same kind of feeling there. So they're like, oh, well, if you're trying to sell me something, if you have an agenda, like I'm just going to unfollow you. I, that's, that's not valuable. So now in the world of long-term reoccurring satisfied viewership, just make sure you're coming from a place of really genuine, just like, okay, I'm making this to either entertain or educate, and then at the very end, be open about the fact that, oh, I also have a business, I also have a product, and I, I'd like to, to sell it to you. So, so um, yeah, so things are changing. Um, I'll, I won't take up all the time. Oh, Instagram videos, I'll touch on that. I mean, Instagram's interesting how <laughs> you've seen in the, literally the last few years, Instagram was sort of a niche platform to now the most dominant cultural force in the social media space. And you gotta stay nimble because it's always changing. Um, you know, we talked, I touched on the fact that Vine shut down. Well, actually, there's a new app coming out called Byte by, the, by uh, Vine's co-founder, Dom Hoffman. Um, and there's a huge micro-community, about 70,000 Vine creators rallying around that. And an app like that that's going to come out this summer, you know, could come out and either completely flop or suddenly it's the next TikTok. 
um, which is, you know, TikTok is now, the right now it's the it social network that's spreading everywhere. So that means that now Instagram is almost like the Facebook, which is like the old, uh, you know, the, the standby. So things, the point is things are changing all the time. So no matter where you're publishing, you just have, it's, all, it's just publish everywhere and don't publish the same thing everywhere. I think actually that's one thing I'll, I'll note on this slide. You know, there's Instagram stories, which are the ephemeral 24 hour stories. There's the main feed posts, which are evergreen, so they last forever. Um, you might think, oh, well I made a YouTube video. I'll just cut that into, you know, parse it into a Instagram story and then I'll also post that to Instagram and maybe I'll also post that same video on LinkedIn. Now, that'll save you time producing, but in the world where you can take out your phone and just hit record and make more content, there's no reason not to. There's no reason not to create individual assets for every single uh, platform and every single feature on that platform. So create a unique Instagram story, create a unique um, TikTok video, create a unique Twitter post. Um, so yeah, and then and then you'll stand out. Um, any other slides? Oh, email and video. Actually, yeah, let's go with Darius. This is Darius Santos from Dub. Thank you for my time. Hello, everyone. All right, so um, we've talked a little bit about some more generic things uh, on like a higher level. What we're going to do now is just kind of dive into some specifics of how to begin incorporating video into emails. And there's going to be a couple of other slides uh, that really I'm going to talk about some specific uh, best practices and things like that. So um, the idea here is obviously you can't attach videos into emails themselves. You can't embed an entire video in an email. There's typically an attachment limit of like 25 megabytes. Um, which would be just a few seconds of, of HD video or 1080 or even 720p. So you can't attach a video itself into an email, but the best practice in the industry now is typically a link to the video, and you want to make that link as attractive as possible. This day and age, people are very hesitant to click links, uh, even if they're from a trusted source, because you know what's to say that your account didn't get hacked and you're you know sending malicious you know links through your email. So people are very hesitant to click links. And so in replacement of a link, uh, your best bet is to do some type of previews, like a preview image, whether that's a thumbnail image or what actually we do within our company is use animated GIFs. So what that is is a, like a little three-second loop, or actually you can do, change the length of that GIF as long as you want. But the idea is to use an animated preview inside of the email that's really going to help click-through rates tremendously. Um, by giving a preview of the video, you can give like your best part of the video uh, to make that email look as interesting as possible. And you can even use like a, a custom GIF. You know, so the, the, the preview itself doesn't have to be related to the video. Um, so obviously, if the, the video is just kind of a talking head, maybe you want to make the, the thumbnail a bit more interesting than that, um, whatever that might be. So we don't have any uh, examples of really cool GIFs uh, here in the slides, but we use a bunch of different ones in, in our own emails and our drip sequences. So whenever you're trying to incorporate a video into an email, this is best done by giving an animated preview. Um, just tons of studies out there have shown that it's going to drive the highest click-through rates. Um, so whether that's using a service, like there's plenty of free ones out there. You can generate GIFs of your own. Um, a platform like ours does, the cert, does that automatically. So when you're attaching videos into emails, that link is going to then go to um, the video itself. So I think a lot of people will utilize, um, say, YouTube for a free video hosting service. And so, you know, to be a link to a YouTube video and they click that, it takes them to the video where you may set that to private so that, you know, that only that person can view it or only the person with the link or it may be a public video. Um, but the idea there is that that's where the entire video would play. And so if you have something you're trying to communicate um, through whether that's a visual element or just your interpersonal communication, you wanted to, you know, put a name to the a face to the name, um, really it doesn't matter what the purpose of the video is. Um, the idea is that it's going to go to that hosted source. Um, there's also things like Vimeo and Wistia um, or, or Dub. So you can have these videos hosted on, on any number of places. And the idea here is to get the most value out of where that video is hosted. So on YouTube, you can have things like uh, click the link below and you can have some hyperlink in the description or you can say, you know, or stay tuned and, you know, or click over here. You can say things like that. Um, other services like Dub or Wistia also provide like call to action buttons. And really, uh, as Ruben was mentioning earlier, that's the, the point of the video is to drive action and to drive steps. And so when you have clear, actionable next steps in the video um, or attached to the video, that's really gonna, where you're going to have the highest 
uh, conversion rates. You're going to have the highest click-throughs there because those those steps, you know, there's not any guesswork. They don't have to say, oh, well, I watched this video, now what? Or, or click this link. Um, so depending upon what your, your video's intention is, um, the idea is to get as much value out of that hosted source as you can. So if you use a service, a paid service like Vimeo or Dub or Wistia, um, you want to have that as branded as you can. You know, we want to give as much value to where that video is hosted as you can. So whether that's your, your branding, your calls to actions, additional resources. So um, what we typically do is we're using videos for sales in a lot of aspects. And this isn't something that's done widely because as some people in the audience have said, you know, they have videos they need to produce and they have to have them produced and this is like a, a third party or it's maybe it's done internally, but it's more of a commercial asset. And the idea is we really need to be equipping everyone with the power to leverage video of the, for themselves. So this includes salespeople, this includes business development representatives, anyone that is communicating uh, on a daily basis with customers, they should have the ability to leverage video for themselves. And so sending video through email, has, like I said, has historically been pretty difficult. You know, you're attaching a YouTube link, you record the video, upload it to YouTube, and then here's the link to it, and then you kind of hope for the best. Um, so the idea behind that is, as I said, equipping everyone that is applicable with the power to leverage video of their own. There's a ton of assets out there, um, such as Dub or Wistia, Vimeo. There's a lot of Chrome extensions. You can do things like screen recordings. Um, the, the idea is to provide not only a, a, na a face to the name, but also you can begin building that trust and that relationship um, through the power of video. I mean, have you ever, you know, we're in, we're in LA and you've maybe seen a celebrity and you just kind of get that feeling like, oh my God, I know that person. And you don't know them, you know, you've just seen them on movies and, or maybe clips, but you still get that feeling. And that's just because of the, cre the relationship that's been established through video. It's a completely um, asynchronous, just one direction. You know, you've just seen a video. They don't know who you are, but you have that feeling um, created by the video. And so as Ruben touched on, it's a very neural thing that's happening, and you need to be leveraging that on the widest scale possible. So your salespeople, your, anyone communicating, even customer support, um, and CEOs, like literally everyone should be leveraging the power of video to get what they can out of it. Um, so we were talking about how specifically, uh, one more, can we go back to the, still the emailing the video, the best practices there is to use an animated preview and then direct them to the hosted source whether that's, like I said, a Vimeo, or if it is YouTube, if you're you know, tight on a budget and you wanna use the free tools out there, um, trying to get as much value out of those videos as possible. So it's not just the video itself, you're trying to bring value to when they're actually viewing the video. Um, and the most valuable part of viewing your videos is actually the data. So in the next slide, so we're talking about analytics from, from your videos. So you can see things like, you know, how much of your video they watched. Did they click your calls to action? Did they click the links? Um, so a lot of free tools probably will not provide this detailed analytics. So if you plan on leveraging video, it's definitely in your best interest to have this information available. Sources like, like Dub, Vimeo, Wistia, they do provide uh, accurate, detailed reporting. And that data is what's gonna help you really learn from your videos. You know, you're gonna see drop-off rates, like say if they watch 50% of your video and that's a continued thing, then you realize that at some point in this video you're losing them and this video needs to be addressed, especially if that's a reoccurring asset, like this is an advertisement or it's a pitch video. Um, like a lot of salespeople, as I mentioned, equipping salespeople with video is gonna be in everyone's best interest. They can begin to develop those relationships and they can get their personality across. And not only that, but they're gonna be able to provide a visual element of anything like a screen recording. You know, so say instead of sending this long, boring email where you're trying to explain things and throw in screenshots, it's gonna be much quicker and more efficient to just create a screen recording. You can include your face on there and say, hey, so we're talking about this line, this line, this line, and then attach that into an email um, to be sent out. And that's gonna be, and you have the data reporting for that, so you can see when that prospect opened the video, what percentage of it that they watched. All those, those data points are really what helps you learn from your videos. Because if you're not learning, you're, you're kind of stagnant. And if you're not growing, you know, if, if you're not growing your, uh, what you're actually doing in your videos, then that's gonna be not, not be beneficial. Sorry, I'm getting distracted from the time. Got it, 20 minutes, thank you, sir. Um, so the idea here is to begin leveraging video. I mean, if you're not already, this is definitely something you should be looking into. There's a tremendous push. Uh, so something like Cisco says 80% of all internet traffic is video. Um, by 2020, it's gonna be as high as 90%. 
So people are just much more accommodated to watching video versus you know, reading a really long blog. Um, even you know, Google and YouTube, they recognize the value of video. So if you put a video on a blog, it's gonna rank much higher than those without. So um, the, getting used to using video is something you need to do now, sooner than later. And you know, being able to actually learn from your data is going to be crucial to that development. So as you begin incorporating video, you know, early on it's gonna be a learning process. You're gonna, you know, kind of stub your toe a couple of times. Um, and so like having that, you know, million view video, that's, that's the dream. But in order to get there, it's definitely gonna be a process. And having the data to back that up is gonna be what's gonna be allow you to grow. So you need to see when, what video engagement's like, ideally developing a target audience. All of those things are, are kind of um, systematic in this fact that you, it's not one time. You don't produce one video and you're gonna get these learnings. And so we were talking about data tracking specifically. Um, I'm not sure what's on this slide, but the idea here is to track the more important parts of your data, like the engagement, how much of the video are they watching, are they clicking through, and if they aren't, what can you do to improve that? So every, just like when you're sending an email campaign, everything needs to be A-B tested. So you have one video, you try that for a while, see what the, the engagement is like, the click through, and then you try another video. So we, we're talking not so much about video types here. As I mentioned, you have the sales people's videos, you have your produced videos, your commercials. Um, and so each of these, it's the same strategy. It's, you're gonna have to take learnings from that. It's a, it's a process, it's not a, you know, here we got one video and let's just keep retrying that thing. It's, a, it's definitely a, a curve here. And it's all about the data. So. Um, not sure if there's a whole lot more I can say about that. It's, it's just a, it's a matter of being able to track that data. And if you're not tracking the data, you're really missing out on a huge aspect and you're not really getting everything you can from using video. So when you begin incorporating video into your business and into your prospecting and sales, you need to be following up with the data so that you can then learn and grow. That's it. Thanks, Darius. Round of applause. Um, so let's wrap up um, just to keep a little bit of time for Q&A. Um, so just a couple of key takeaways here. Um, video is easy to create, to produce, and to distribute. We should all start doing it. Um, you know, the, the key here is making consistent, high-quality content. Now, high-quality does not mean overproduced. High-quality just means value-oriented. Um, the second thing is that, you know, it's all about the storytelling. It's what people really, truly connect to. It's a human being that's sharing a story, that's expressing empathy, empathy, that's addressing some sort of a pain point and potentially providing a solution. That sequence works, it's worked since the dawn of time and it will continue to work as long as it's honest and authentic. Um, each platform, each channel deserves its own content. Instagram is now pushing square shaped videos and now nine by 16 format size, whereas YouTube, as Shannon mentioned, is promoting longer format, 16 by nine. You know, Facebook is, is sort of starts at the six to 12 second mark and then goes up to the two minute mark, um, 16 by nine or square or nine by 16. The point is, is that every channel has its own parameters and we should understand what those parameters are and create content to be able to place on those. Uh, email is a powerful means of still sending videos. These can be sent on a one-to-one -one basis or these can be sent on a mass basis. Um, it's also great to create automated workflows where you have multiple videos that are being sent via emails or other distribution methods because as you guys know, if you're in sales or definitely in marketing, that it requires a number of touch points to ultimately get your conversion. Um, Let's be data oriented. Let's look at our analytics. Let's understand what the view rates are, what the watch rates are, what the conversion rates are, what the click rates are, what the you know, average um, sales cycle lengths are. There's a lot of economics that we can look in here. And from that, we can understand our customer acquisition cost and our long lifetime value. And to, of course, go rinse and repeat, do our testing so that we can make constant improvements.
Thanks for listening, guys. <laughs> when I have money, I just like spend it. And it has to look nice and it has to catch my attention. I only buy if I really, really like it. Because if it doesn't catch my attention, I don't want to buy it. What makes consumers decide to buy? Optimize those conversions. <laughs> Psychology, the science of how people think. Who am I buying this from? And do I trust these people? Here's the reviews. Like for quality. Do I actually need this thing? Am I just wanting it? Think of all that stuff. Quality is really important. And then price. I think they match. Overall screening process takes place. During that screening process, you want to reach out to these people with pertinent information. They're early on in that screening process where they're deciding if they trust you, trust your company. Something that's trusted, you know, something that yeah. a certain brand is trusted and a certain brand isn't. And so how do you then address that? Delivering content, an email, a text message, anything like that to start building trust with those people, whether it's from the salesperson or the company, website. It's really about how you make people feel. You want them to feel good about buying something. Humans are emotional. Uh, the feeling. So when I buy something and then I'm happy, so that's why I decide. To trigger those emotions, you have to tell a story. Talk about how your company was founded. Talk about the mission behind your company. Really tell that story so people understand what they're buying and the story behind what they're buying so they can feel good about it. Oh, like eco-friendly products? I go for it. <laughs> you feel good about buying something that's hyper-targeted to you. You're a business traveler, packaged in a way, put it in a suitcase and travel with it, tailored for them. So bottom line is tell your story. You know, according to the Harvard Business Review, they've actually done some studies. When trust is high, conversions are going to be a lot higher. Well, I know it's going to help me. A huge part of the buying decision-making process is building trust. Yes, it's about telling the story, but it's also about communicating. It's about that two-way conversation. If someone tweets your company account, have a real person there to talk to them. If they want to connect with a human. Resources can be a limitation here, so the idea is to do your best. You never know when someone could become a customer. Maybe they're even just kind of curious, just asking a general question. Be available on all those channels. You have someone on phones, emails, social channels. Don't spread yourself too thin to where each of the channels aren't getting the appropriate attention. As available as you can, that's what's gonna allow people to recommend your business to other people. When you do take advantage of bot technology, make sure that it is as conversational as possible. You want those to be a replication of a human. There's limitations to that. We're not talking about the type of bots that automatically generate and leave comments on Instagram. We're talking about the type of bots that actually act as an ambassador to your company. So when someone visits your website, you should have like a chat application. A human Human, manning that chat application is ideal when that's not an option. Having a chat bot, people can come in, ask questions, get answers, and then be directed to the appropriate resources. Montage. Let's face it, people buy stuff based on trends. What's cool, what's kitschy, what's rad, what's in the feed right now, what their friends are talking about. We're all influenced by people, we're all influenced by brands. Some of us more than others. People are telling us what they want to buy, we just have to listen to it. We can do our research to figure out what people want and what they're influenced by and what are the trends that are driving them. Sometimes people make fun of trends or they say that people just blindly follow brands or people. But it's a reality, we're all influenced by trends. Matter of fact, I'm going shopping right now. No one likes the feeling of buyer's remorse. Businesses, consumers, it's a lose-lose. Actionable tips to avoid buyer's remorse. Following up with people after having made a purchase. Thanking them for making the purchase. Not just trying to upsell people like, oh, you've bought something, now I'll try to buy something else. Giving whatever reward you can to someone for making a purchase. Whether that's something like a free shipping or a coupon. It's not just how they feel during the sale, it's how they feel after the sale is also equally important. Common factors seem to be trust and feeling. Do they trust the brand? How does the brand build the trust with them? And how does that make them feel before and after the decision they've made to purchase? Thanks so much for watching this video. And if you're not already, consider subscribing to our channel. Bye.